Today on Family Talk. The 23rd Psalm reminds us that the Lord is always by our side, even when we walk through the darkest of valleys. Hello, everyone. I'm Roger Marsh, and today on Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk, you will hear the heartbreaking story of a brave woman who has experienced tremendous loss but learned to rely on God despite her circumstance. Her name is Rachel Flick. She is the widow of Colorado Springs police officer Micah Flick, who was murdered in the line of duty this past February. She joins Dr. Dobson in the studio today to talk about Micah as a husband, a father, and a godly man, and to express her deep gratitude to the Colorado Springs community for their love and support through this time. Let's listen now to her conversation with Dr. James Dobson on this edition of Family Talk. We're going to be talking to Rachel Flick, who is the widow of Micah Flick. Uh, He was murdered right here in Colorado Springs on February the 5th, 2018. This entire city was in grief for days after Micah's passing. And we want you to know how to pray for Rachel and her children. She has two children, and uh, she's a very special lady, and she's been through a horrendous tragedy. And uh, I hope that uh, this uh, program today will help you know how to pray for her and to carry her in your heart. Uh, Rachel, thank you for coming to talk Uh, about your husband. He was a great man, wasn't he? Thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to come Mm. on the show with you. And yes, Micah was a great man. He was a hero in every sense of the word. He was a deputy sheriff. Yes, sir. But was working as a detective. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have been married to him for 10 years. Yes, sir. And had a great marriage. Mm Mm-hmm. I uh, have uh, an interview with you that was done by the uh, Colorado Springs Gazette. Okay. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read it. Not Because at all. that will get some of the details. If there's something here that's not accurate, you tell me about it. Okay. Rachel begins by saying, losing Micah was our worst fear, but a very present reality. We had a deal that every morning he kissed me goodbye, regardless of how we had left the night before. If we were frustrated or happy with one another, that he would always kiss me goodbye because we knew that day could be our last. To cope with... hmm, That touches my heart. To cope with the loss of her husband, Rachel Flick said... She relies on her faith, which has enabled her to forgive his killer. I know that Jesus forgave me of things I absolutely did not deserve to be forgiven for, and that he commands us to forgive as we have been forgiven. But it's really important with forgiveness to remember that forgiveness is not saying that what the other person did was okay that I should allow them to continue doing anything of the sort, or that I do not continue to be in pain because of what they did. Mrs. Flick said her husband was devoted to their seven-year-old twins. Every Friday night was family fun night, and the Friday before he died, they played Scrabble Junior for the first time. And she said, Micah was the best dad. And he played with Eliana and Levi as long as possible, she said. He was always taking them to the park, playing hours of football with Levi, and would take Eliana to coffee shops with a fresh sketch pad where they would both enjoy their love of art and connected in that way with creativity. She said her children are hurting. She was able to explain Micah's death to them in part because they already had lost great-grandparents. They had a really good idea of what death was and what it meant, Rachel Flick said. And so when I told them that Daddy was gone, that he wasn't living anymore, They are very capable of understanding that at a pretty articulate level. During the procession after the funeral, 
Rachel Flick said her daughter told her, Mommy, seeing all these people honoring Daddy makes my heart a little bit happier. Mrs. Flick said that in the weeks since her husband's death, many have commented on her strength. We're still moving through life hour by hour, sometimes one breath at a time, she said. We cry as a family together often, but we don't grieve like people without hope because we know that Micah lives. Micah is in heaven, which is a very real place, and we're going to see him again. She also called for respect for law enforcement and nationwide unity. Micah was a courageous man and a man of integrity, but Micah was human. And he struggled with insecurity just like all of us do, she said. He always asked himself if he was doing enough. Did his sacrifice make a difference? When I watched you from behind Micah's hearse, lining the streets and waving flags, you told me that he did matter. You brought your children to salute Micah on the way to his final resting place. You modeled honor and respect for Micah and the men and women who risk their lives every day for us. That is a very, very touching uh, talk about what you just touched there, about the people of Colorado Springs lining the streets. Mm -hmm. Uh, it It was a remarkable thing. Describe that day. Everywhere we went that week, Uh, between the day that Micah was killed and the day that he was buried, there was a formal processional, and Colorado State Patrol would close the roads everywhere we went, and there was a motorcycle um, escort, Escort. and we um, had the honor guard with us everywhere we went. Um, I had never been exposed to a line-of-duty death before and how they honor that officer with everything they have over every moment, even to the point that Micah's body was never alone 24 hours a day, even at the coroner's office, there was honor guard standing beside him throughout the night watches. And so for the people to show that that was also important to them, that they would come out because the first procession from the hospital was late in the evening, it was very cold, And they had put out the processional route only, you know, within an hour. And yet people still made time to come and to bring their children bundled up like little marshmallows with flags and put their hands over their hearts as Micah passed by on the way to the coroner's office. And we sat in the undersheriff's vehicle and followed Micah to the coroner's office and Mm -hmm. watched all of these people who had sacrificed their time and energy and comfort to come out and say, we honor law enforcement, we honor Micah, his death matters to us. How did the killing occur? Micah uh, was on an undercover um, auto theft investigation team that regularly, at least once a week, went out and um, found stolen cars and followed them until they were able to connect the person who had stolen the car with the car. And then in plain clothes, they would go and apprehend the suspect. So Mm -hmm. on that Monday, they had been following this particular person throughout the day. And as they had done many times, very skillfully, highly skilled team of men and women, they went out and um, around uh, 3.30, 3.45, the operation took place where the suspect was far enough away from the car to do what they called a snatch and grab, mm-hmm. where they would um, just wrap him up and put handcuffs on him and take him to jail. And um, this particular gentleman um, had a gun in his hoodie. And when he was surrounded by five or six officers and they um, you know, said police, he pulled the gun out of his hoodie and began to shoot. And the first bullet went into Deputy Scott Stone. He uh, hit him in the hip. And as Scott has told me, that he went to 
um, shoot Scott in the head for the kill shot. And Micah stepped in between Scott and his killer and um, to wrestle the gun down from him and uh, made a one in a million shot just about half an inch above his vest right into his neck and his chest. Mm -hmm. Did he die instantly? It's interesting hearing the different testimonies from the men and women who were there that day because when, as Grossman calls, code black, when you go to that level of arousal and you get tunnel vision and yeah. ringing in your ears and, and everyone sees the story slightly differently, and that's normal for trauma. Yes. But So I've heard several uh, different accounts, but it sounds like he didn't live for more than five minutes at most. Mm -hmm. How common is this now? We hear in the national media of these senseless killings that are taking place, like the one in Dallas where five uh, police officers went down. From your perspective, how often is this occurring? And when you said that every morning you knew could be your last with your husband, is that uh, an overstatement or was that a reality that you lived with? I believe that that's a reality that we lived with. Um, we are in a nation right now that is at a crisis of um, disrespect for law enforcement. And the two officers who were killed in Colorado before Micah, Heathgum and Zachary Parrish, those were ambush killings where people intentionally called the police so that they could take their lives and for no other reason. And that has also happened in Louisiana and in Texas, and it's happening nationally. So I believe that that is a very current, present reality that people are looking to take the lives of police officers as a political statement. The two officers who were sitting down to dinner on the East Coast um, who were killed just a couple weeks ago, the man came up and just killed them sitting there eating their lunch for no other reason than he wanted to take the lives of people who represented authority. There is so much what would be called random violence in our country at this time. It's a sickness. It's a disease. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, shortly after Micah died, the uh, event at the school in Florida mm. uh, took place. And uh, your story kind of got meshed with that one and, in fact, uh, maybe got less publicity than uh, what was taking place in Florida. Is that correct? The news cycle moves so fast, you know, and the people who were interested in Micah's story the week that he died had to transition into um, recognizing what was going on down there in southeast Florida, and that was a very big deal, and many lives were lost. And I don't believe that people cared any less that his life had been taken, but um, the opportunity to tell his story might have been shortened a little bit. Mm. You've done a lot of interviews, though, haven't you? I've done a lot of interviews locally here in the Springs yeah. um, for the news and for various different activities, like the police memorial that was just unveiled down at Memorial Park and for things like that. So the, the Describe local media, that. There is a memorial site. So for 13 years, the um, team that has been creating this memorial has been working on it. And for this year, they were finally able to finish and unveil this beautiful memorial that's down at Memorial Park, um, right by Prospect Lake. And it's absolutely worth going and seeing. They put the Lion of Lucerne up there um, on a beautiful granite slab where they engraved the men and women's names who've lost their lives in the line of duty. Mm -hmm. And it really touches your heart. It's a powerful tribute. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about your children. You, they're twins. They are. And their ages. They are seven, Eliana and Levi. And how in the world did you tell them their dad wasn't coming home? We received calls from the family the day that Micah died, and they said that he had been shot. And I said, well, where has he been shot? And they said, in the chest. And I thought, well, he's wearing his vest. So I'm anticipating that I'll go to the hospital and, you know, maybe he'll be in surgery and we'll have a long night. And so 
I had the kids put some snacks and, you know, an iPad in the bag and, you know, put on comfy clothes thinking that we might have a long night in the hospital to sit by his bedside. And then I received a call from the undersheriff and he said, I'd like to pick you up. And I thought, well, it can't be good if they think you can't drive yourself. And when undersheriff Breister got to me in the driveway, my children were a little ways back with with my brother and sister-in-law. And he said, I'm so sorry to tell you that Mike is gone. And so I rode to the hospital lights and sirens with the undersheriff. And that gave me kind of a moment to cry and scream and pray and throw a fit for about 15 minutes. That must have been crushing. I can't imagine. As I said in that, that report that you read from the Gazette, it was my worst fear realized. You know, the daily reality that I lived with, someone brought me that in truth. And so um, I felt a tremendous surrounding of the presence of God in that car, even as I was in so much pain. Um, I felt and saw him all around me as we drove to the hospital. And so because I had been given that moment to throw my fit, I was able to gather myself that when they brought the twins into the room with the family, I took them on my lap and I said, Daddy's not here anymore. He's in heaven. He Mm. didn't make it. How did they react? You know, I had them one on each knee and one arm around each kiddo, which as a twin mom, you learn to hold both your kids at the same time, no matter what. And so, you know, they leaned in and and we all cried together. And the room was full of the immediate family, which for us is about 14 people or so. And we were all just, you know, crying, grieving, wailing, weeping, just overwhelmed. Did they know he was in a dangerous business? Absolutely. I, you know, we talked a lot about what daddy did and that he took the bad guys to jail and what it would be for that day, how he executed his job. We prayed for him every morning on the way to school. We prayed for daddy's physical safety and that he would be successful in what he did. And I would pray and then they would take turns praying before we got out of the car to go to school every morning. So that was very much part of our family conversation. What incredible courage he showed and what mm-hmm. sacrifice he made. Is there a fund for the education of your children? Because my husband died in the line of duty, the federal government has a provision that um, has a college education fund for them. And that is adequately funded? You know, that's one of the questions that I haven't dug into is how much they receive. Mm-hmm. That's a question moving forward to kind of explore some of the benefits that we haven't had a chance to tap into yet. Are your kids in a Christian school or a private school? They are in a charter school, yes. um, one of our local classical academies. Well, I would like to uh, ask our listeners who are able to help uh, to also uh, contribute to the fund that's been set up. Uh, in situations like this. And so those who would like to donate to the Flick family, uh, please go to the El Paso County Sheriff's Office Foundation. That's Mm -hmm. 1980 Dominion Way, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80918. Let me say it again. El Paso County Sheriff's Office Foundation, 1980 Dominion Way, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80918. One eight. Rachel, you told the Gazette, our local paper, mm-hmm. that you had forgiven the killer of your husband. Yes. Uh, and that it was obviously difficult for you because the Bible demands that you do that. And yet, how do you do that uh, to uh, find forgiveness for a person who... Uh, in a in a vicious and violent way, took your husband away from you. Um, how hard was it for you to do that? I found the strength to forgive Micah's killer because I in no way have lived a perfect life. And I have had seasons where shame was a very real companion for choices that I have made. And I have seen in a picture in my mind Jesus sitting down with me in that place of shame 
and being present with me in that pain and giving me his tangible, literal forgiveness when I was absolutely in sin. And that experience was transformative for me. And so I know that it is not my right to hold judgment over others that the Lord says, vengeance is mine and I will repay. And if did I you trust, struggle with it or did the Lord get you over that hump? I think that there have been other places in past relationships where I've really wrestled with forgiveness and worked through that place. I'm not saying that I won't struggle again with the reality that that man took Micah's life. But as I have prayed through it, um, I have said, Lord, why, you know, why allow Micah to die that day? And he said to me, Rachel, Micah gave his life and no one has anything more precious that they can give in this earth than their life. And I allowed him to give that gift. Mm, And so that perspective is what I took into that process of forgiving Micah's killer and truly releasing him to the Lord. You know, I'm not a uh, theologian, and I never claim to be, uh, but there's a theological understanding of that forgiveness that's helpful to me, and I don't even know if it's accurate, but let me share it with you. Mm. Um, feelings are neither moral or immoral. Mm. You can't help what you feel. Right. Feelings happen, mm-hmm. and forgiveness does not require you not to feel. No, not at all. And you can you can stuff that down if you want to, uh, if you feel you're obligated to. And I don't think it's a violation of forgiveness to still feel that man hurt me. Absolutely. That man did something Absolutely. terrible to me. Yeah. And he deserves whatever the state chooses to do with him. What forgiveness means in that context is that I don't want to hurt him. If I could take vengeance on him, I wouldn't do it. I have given this issue to the Lord, and I'm I'm saying vengeance is thine, Mm. and I will not try to take that. Mm -hmm. Um, But I still have feelings. Absolutely. You understand the difference between those two? Yes, I have a mentor that says feelings don't have brains. (laughs) Yes, but they occur. They are very powerful, right? But we can't... um, believe that we haven't forgiven because we still wrestle with the emotion of the event. And I've had another counselor that said to me, you'll never heal the heart with logic. Yeah. And so there are places in that that have nothing to do with the logic of believing that God will do what he said he will do and that he promises to repay what the locusts have eaten. He promises to bring beauty from ashes. He promises to restore what the enemy has stolen. In Genesis 50, 20, he said, what you intended for my evil, the Lord intended for my good. And I can stand on those promises and still hurt. Well, we pray that the first part of Rachel's story has touched you and and moved you to pray for her family and the safety of all police officers across the country. If you feel God prompting you to support the Flick family financially during this unbelievably difficult time, visit our broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org. There you'll find a link to the El Paso County Sheriff's Office Foundation, which will directly help Rachel and her children. Again, go to drjamesdobson.org and then click onto the broadcast tab. We encourage you to also check out our Facebook page today to see videos and pictures that we've posted there of Rachel's speech at the Police Memorial here in Colorado Springs. Now, you can find our page when you search for Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. Thanks so much for listening today, and be sure to join us again tomorrow to hear the conclusion of Rachel Flick's story. I'm Roger Marsh, and we hope you'll join us again next time right here on Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. Family Talk is not associated with Focus on the Family. Someone once said, if you remove the rocks from a brook, it would lose its song. Well, that holds true for you and me as well. Author Scott Walker tells of the time he was asked to help some friends dig through the ashes of their house after a fire. When they arrived, all that was standing was a portion of the outer brick wall. 
Where the piano once stood lay only a pile of ashes and twisted wire. Nothing had survived the blaze. But while sifting through the debris, Walker came across a tiny china bluebird. He wiped away the soot to find that the colors were still bright. A few hairline cracks had formed in the glaze, but beyond that, it remained intact. Walker writes, as I gazed down at the bird's small beak and two black eyes, I wanted to weep. If only this little bluebird could talk, what a story it would tell. A story of the heat of the night, of terror, of survival against great odds. And then the crucial question hit me. Why did this China bluebird survive? It had survived the fire because it had been tested by fire. And so it is with human beings who have been refined in life's raging furnace. They are tougher, harder, and more resilient than those who have never faced difficulty and loss. That understanding may help us cope the next time the heat is turned up on our tranquil little world. To find out how you can partner with Family Talk, go to drjamesdobson.org.